Today's video has been sponsored by our partners at The Sojourn, as this critically acclaimed audio drama returns with the first volume of Season 2, featuring a full voice cast including Dominic Keating from Star Trek Enterprise and Ben Prendergast from God of War Ragnarok and Apex Legends. Get all three episodes and the entirety of Season 1 on Nebula, Spotify, Google Books, Apple Books and more. All episodes are also available at every tier of the Patreon linked below, with higher tiers getting fun bonus content like ship charts and a high detailed cross-section poster of the hero ship of the series. If you don't know what the Sojourn is, then head over to their YouTube channel for free samples as well as extra lore content and ship breakdowns. The Sojourn Season 2 Volume 1, out now. Hello everybody and welcome back to Space Dock. I'm Hujuana and today we're looking at a very promising near future option for space travel, the nuclear thermal rocket engine. First, a reminder of how rocket engines even work, thanks to Newton's third law of motion. Throw something one way, you go the other. Action, reaction. Regular chemical rockets achieve this through the power of fire, burning their propellant with an onboard oxidizer so that it all expands into a gas which is then directed by a nozzle. Hot gas goes one way, rocket goes the other. Action, reaction. This works great, but the efficiency of burning chemical propellants is not the best. There's only so much chemical energy in there to be used, and while you can do better with weird propellant mixtures, there's still a bit of a cap on what they are capable of, which is where nuclear power comes in. The big thing with nuclear fission, besides the radiation, is that it generates heat. A lot of heat. It's possible to harvest that to expand the propellant without the need to burn it. That cools the reactor while creating thrust, and if using a nice, low molecular weight propellant like hydrogen, it can exit the nozzle at much higher velocities than what comes out of a chemical rocket. Higher exhaust velocity is more efficient, so you can go further while using the same mass of propellant, though the trade-off is lower thrust. This high efficiency is desirable because it can cut down on travel time for interplanetary trips, cutting off months at a time from trips to Mars or beyond, meaning less exposure to cosmic rays and needing to take fewer supplies. For near future warships, it means they have longer endurance, being able to do more engine burns for evasion or intercepts. Technically speaking, you can run basically any fluid through a nuclear thermal rocket to use as propellant, like methane or water. It'll still expand from the heat and go shooting off out the nozzle, but those are heavier molecules than pure hydrogen. Because it's the lightest element, you get more kinetic energy per unit mass by heating up hydrogen than you do out of anything else, making it the most efficient option. Remember that low thrust thing? That's also because of the low molecular weight of hydrogen. The very simplest form of nuclear thermal rocket is the radioisotope rocket, which just have hot nuclear fuel and then the propellant that runs past it. They're not nuclear reactors, they don't do anything exciting. The fuel just sits there, constantly giving off heat and a bit of nasty radiation as the unstable atomic nuclei within it decay. Technologically simple and efficient, but low power and very low thrust as they rely on passive decay. There's also no way to control the heat, it's just on all the time, needing radiators to get rid of it when the propellant isn't flowing and taking the heat array with it. The next step up is the solid core nuclear reactor. These work with full-blown nuclear fission to get even more heat out of the nuclear fuel than what simple radioactive decay is capable of. Splitting open fissile atoms with a neutron releases fast-moving smaller atoms, gamma radiation and even more neutrons, which can then go on to break apart more atoms. Those fast-moving smaller atoms and the gamma rays are what make heat. More heat means faster exhaust velocity means more efficiency. By controlling what the neutrons are doing, you can dial in how much fission is going on, or turn it off completely. One way of doing this is to have rotating drums around the reactor, with neutron absorbing material on one side and neutron reflecting material on the other. Absorbing the neutrons means they don't trigger any fission, so the reactor is off. The downside is that this isn't like flipping a switch. There's a ramp time while the reactor warms up or cools down, so the propellant needs to be running through the reactor to cool it while it's not at full power. 
power, which needs to be taken into account when doing engine burns. It's not as easy as in KSP. The solid cores themselves can be simple long rods of stacked nuclear fuel pellets with coolant flowing around them. The internal structure and the fuel rods need to be able to withstand the 2 to 3000 Kelvin operating temperature of the reactor, which does put a hard limit on what the engine is capable of. It is possible to go a bit higher by changing the form factor of the fuel, such as by encasing it in thousands of little balls that are spun centrifugally so they don't fall out of the nozzle, with the propellant flowing through the gaps between them. There's other designs like little pins but I think the so-called pebble and particle bed reactors are the most developed alternative designs. A benefit of hauling around a nuclear reactor with you all the time is that you can tap it for electrical power as well as thrust. Sure, you need a radiator rights to make a cold side, but it does mean you can power your whole spacecraft without needing another system, or even run electrical engines like ion thrusters for super high efficiency engine burns. It's also possible to squeeze more efficiency out of an NTR by slapping on an electrical second stage to it. In this example, that's done by looping the hydrogen through the reactor twice. The first pass runs a generator, and the second pass gets a little extra cesium added to it to improve its electrical conductivity. It then zooms out the nozzle as normal, but there's electromagnets around it which accelerate the exhaust even more. There's other variants of this with different types of generator or method of electrical boost, but they're all the same basic concept. You can learn more about these on the Tough SF blog. While high efficiency is great, the low thrust can sometimes be too low, but there is a way to improve it by dumping liquid oxygen into the exhaust, a bit like an afterburner from a jet engine. This extra mass does drop the efficiency, but that's a fair trade-off for the extra oomph you get, and the exhaust plume changes colour too. Another, more obvious problem with these engines is of course the radiation. Obviously, radiation exposure is bad for people, but it's also bad for the ship itself. Neutrons zipping out of the reactor bump their way into the materials of the ship, knocking atoms inside those materials out of place. Slowly, over time, this causes those materials to swell up and become brittle thanks to the atomic scale gaps within them. The neutrons can also wiggle their way into the nuclei of stable atoms, making them radioactive. This is bad. Bad. Radiation also complicates matters when using more than one nuclear engine, since they will be emitting radiation directly into their siblings beside them. But since the reactors are already designed to function in a radioactive environment, this is a minor engineering issue that needs to be taken into account, rather than something that requires changes to spacecraft design, which is what you have to do to protect the crew and structure of the vessel. For crew, you can reduce their exposure simply by putting them as far as possible from the reactor, since exposure drops off rapidly over distance thanks to the inverse square law. To further protect them and the structure of the ship does require some shielding, but you can't fully surround the reactor in lead because that's a waste of mass. There's just not much need to protect the vacuum of space. So you only need a small circle of shielding, just enough to shadow the rest of the ship from the radioactive glow. That's why they're called shadow shields. This does complicate matters when docking to a station or another ship though, since you have to protect the other party from your reactor as well, but this is not an insurmountable problem. Another issue is the limited lifespan of the reactor. Corrosion and the fuel simply being used up means an active reactor has a lifespan measured in hours, which doesn't sound like a lot, but that is time spent running the engine, something that chemical rockets do for only minutes. When the reactor's off, this is not a concern. But then there's another problem with servicing or decommissioning the horribly radioactive reactor, which would need specialist facilities. Another limiting factor of solid core nuclear engines is that they have a maximum efficiency, limited by the melting point of the reactor and the fuel rods. But there is a sneaky way around this by deliberately having a melted down fuel, or even a fully vaporised one and having a gas core reactor. That's right, the nuclear core of these engines is gaseous uranium hexafluoride. This funny shaped design here contains its 25,000 Kelvin fuel in a vortex inside an internally cooled quartz crystal bottle. The blisteringly hot nuclear fuel is prevented from touching the bottle walls by neon, but the immense thermal energy it gives off can shine right through to heat up the hydrogen propellant flowing outside. That's why this is called a nuclear light bulb. But there's still limits here. For one, there's stuff between the hot fuel and the hydrogen which stops part of the heat from reaching it. So let's just get rid of that. Let's just have the hydrogen flow directly around the nuclear gas, transferring even more heat to the propellant and making 
making the engine even more efficient. Oh, what's that? The nuclear fuel leaks out a bit, making the engine plume horrifically radioactive? Fine, let's be boring and keep the nuclear fuel inside the reactor by confining it centrifugally, or magnetically, or in a vortex, or electrostatically. You will notice I skipped a step between solid and gas cores, because while you can try to make a liquid core nuclear rocket, they're basically as technologically challenging as gas cores are, while being worse, so why bother? There is one exception though, and it's possibly one of the most insane rocket engine concepts ever devised. The nuclear salt water rocket, the brainchild of Robert Zubrin. A little bit of uranium salt is mixed in with lots of water, stored in a whole bunch of thin tubes surrounded by a neutron damper to stop it from going spicy mode. As this mix is injected into the engine and freed of its neutron moderating prison, the combined nuclear salt reaches critical mass and basically explodes, instantly vaporizing the water it was mixed with and yeeting out of the nozzle, along with all the nasty nuclear leftovers. This continuous nuclear explosion imparts such an insane amount of energy to the water that it both has high thrust and high efficiency. It sounds like the perfect engine, except for the hideous amount of radiation that sprays out, and the slight challenge of safely maintaining a non-stop nuclear explosion. If you want to know more about this ridiculous thing, Scott Manley has an entire video dedicated to just this. Apart from the crazy last one, all these engines can be built right now, and in fact some of them were built and ground tested decades ago, when enthusiasm for space travel was higher, and concerns over anything nuclear were much lower. Other technologies like remote probes and ion engines became the go-to option for a while, but recently there has been a return of interest in nuclear engines thanks to a renewed space race. And this applies to fiction as well, as nuclear thermal rockets really are the best option for the near future of space travel. Thanks for watching! Don't forget to check out the first volume of Season 2 of The Sojourn and the extra content on their YouTube channel and Patreon. Links are below in the description and pinned comment. Thanks again and I'll see you next time!